Um, thank you very much for the invitation. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here. I was, I was here in this conference last time. That was nine years ago. Freshly minted PhD. And, um, and I must say that it had a, a huge impact in my career. So thanks again. Um, so today, I want to tell you some story um, how interpolation problems um, interact with birational geometry of moduli spaces. But, um, but over since Monday, I changed the idea just a little bit to make it um, a little bit more broad. So I meant to start with, um, to make justice to the panoramic um, adjective of the, of the talk. So let me start from the very beginning and then towards the end I will, I will um, get to interpolation and our contribution, what I think is our contribution to the subject um, in Oaxaca. So let me start from the beginning. So say that we start with, um, with a projective variety, right? And everything I will say holds over the complex numbers. Um, so one starts with a projective variety X, and then one starts asking questions like, what's the dimension of X? Is, is X irreducible? Um, that's, a, that's a basic question that we can say. Um, is X, uh, is, if it is irreducible, what's this dimension? Uh, is X smooth? Right, those are kind of the, um, a few of the first questions we can ask. Then if these three things hold and we know them, then we can start asking questions a bit more specialized. What's the second cohomology over the complex numbers of the variety? And among these cohomology, cohomology classes, what are the algebraic ones? And well, I can continue with this list of more and more um, specialized questions. But then what makes this subject, at least to me, very interesting, meaning algebraic geometry, is that projective varieties always come in families. So, um, so this is the slogan, projective varieties come in families. And the families are themselves algebraic varieties. Oops. And they are varieties as well. And all of a sudden, we can start with a very simple object. And all of a sudden, when we think of his family, um, then these questions are not so trivial anymore. Even if I start with, say, points on the plane, uh, which I will do a little bit later. Um, points on the plane are not like, you know, they don't have a lot of invariance. But then when we think of their families um, of points, then things get a lot interesting, very, very interesting. And, um, and once we have, we have families, there are theorems that apply, that hold, that hold for uh, open sets, like big chunks of the family, open sets of the family. So there are theorems that hold on open sets of the family. So let me give you two important examples. One example of, a, of this type of theorem is the, the left chest hyperplane, left, left chest hyperplane theorem. Um, we heard in um, yesterday's beautiful talk um, on uh, tropical varieties, the hard lectures theorem, and this, this was not mentioned because apparently it's harder. But, um, but for us, um, this, this theorem tells us that there is, there is a whole chunk of varieties in projective space to which I can apply this theorem. So in particular, one can think of one version of this theorem is that if you take D, a surface of degree D with D bigger or equal than four, very general, 
and the, and the very here has mathematical content, very general, then even though the second cohomology of these the second cohomology of these surfaces can be big. The algebraic, the algebraic classes are as small as possible, meaning the theorem says that if x is very general, then its Picard group is the smallest possible, even though the second cohomology group can get large. It, it's actually large. Um, well, um, this is some type of theorem that applies. You start with a, with a hypersurface, look at their families, this is, there's no moduli involved here. It's just moving parameters, moving the coefficients of the hypersurface. And then you look at the family, and there is this big open set for which the, the hypersurfaces there have the, um, the Picard as small as time possible. Let me give you another example of these kind of results. Another important, another important theorem of this type is the Brill Nether. The Brill Nether theorem. And if you don't know what the Brill Nether theorem says, um, you should ask someone in the audience. There are world experts here. Just ask to the person next to you, and that person might know. And if it doesn't know, well, you iterate the process until you get a satisfactory answer. Um, but then this theorem applies to um, general, general C in moduli. I don't, I, um, so, um, so these two theorems, here there's no moduli involved, it's just moving parameters, and then I have a theorem that applies to a big chunk of hypersurfaces. And here, the, the question is a, a lot, well, a little bit more subtle. Here is, applies, it, here is a theorem that applies to an open set of moduli. For a generic curve, then the brillner theorem tells you that uh, we know the cohomology of line bundles on curves, basically. Then, uh, then the question that I want to, uh, I want to focus is, um, it's been so well established that it's more like a method now, is how do these theorems fail? Observe that this, I can, if I, if I write another theorem, I can ask the exact same question. That's why I'm, I'm saying this looks more like a method. So how do these theorems fail, meaning, can you characterize what's, uh, what's in the complement of the open set over which they hold? The Brillner theorem tells you, doesn't tell you much about the open, it just tells you that there is an open set, doesn't tell you much about what's the characterization of it. And same, same thing here. So, um, well, when one tries to analyze that question, things get very interesting. So for instance, this is example number, let me say that this is example number one. So if, what, if I analyze when this theorem does not apply, right, one, um, so fails, say one fails, one arrives at the nether leftist locus, which consists of hypersurfaces of degree D, D greater or equal than four, Right, whose Picard's rank is not C. And then, well, that's obvious from what the theorem says, right? But it turns out that this locus has infinitely many components. And meaning this very here means that the open set we are looking at is not a Sarisky open. The complement is not a finite, a finite a closed subset. There are infinitely many components many irreducible components whose geometry is, is, is very interesting. We don't even know what the dimensions of those components are. So there, there has been a lot of work uh, trying to describe you know, these infinitely many um, gadgets, but we have an idea what the dimensions are, but we don't, we, if you give me a number and you ask me, is, 
is there a component with this dimension? It's l more likely than not, I don't know. And um, by the way, Leal, who is here, raise your hand, Leal, will tell you something about these components. So Leal, I don't want to give it away, but um, will tell you um, that very simple surfaces, the terminental surfaces, form components. Meaning, you take a matrix with integer, with, uh, with polynomial entries, you take the determinant, and that will give you a surface if the matrix has uh, polynomials in four variables. Um, and they form, they fill out components. This is, this is some sort of non-trivial thing. Um, and many of those components were not known. So that is tomorrow. And observe there's no moduli involved. So um, the next case is also interesting. And the next case is, is more in the, of the subject I want to tell you. It's how does the brillouin nether theorem fail? So this will be my theorem number two. So I will start actually labeling generic behavior with the G and failure of generic behavior with an F. For, for, this is for me to signal that I'm looking at some, some sort of result when you know, it's supposed to tell me what's going on in an op on an open set. And then the F is what's in the complement. So if I look at how, how does the brillouin nether theorem fail when uh, one arrives, the failure of, of number two, the brillouin nether theorem, one arrives of the brillouin nether divisor. And Eduardo told us already, there are many, so there are many names attached to this, um, to this, to this name. Um, a few of them, like remember in Eduardo's talk, is David Mumford, Joe Harris, David Eisenbot, and, um, and one of the consequences, consequence, is that MG bar um, is of general type. general type. For G, my impression is that the first computation was bigger or equal than 24. How does this work? Well, if I am to prove that MG is of general type, this is a statement about the canonical class, right? That the canonical class is, has a lot of sections. If I can prove that the canonical class is big, right, then I win. But then uh, proving, computing cohomology of line bundles here is, is difficult. So I will prove that the, co the canonical class is inside the effective cone. Again, how do I prove that? It's, uh, computing effective cones is hard. But then if I can prove that I can write the canonical class as a non-negative linear combination of two effective divisors, then I win. And that's what they did. They wrote the canonical class in terms of boundary divisors, which are effective, and they bring another divisor. So that, of course, factorizes through the, the computation of the, of the class of the real nether divisor, and, and linear limit of linear series comes into play right there. Um, OK, so what's, um, that's more or less what's in the complement of, of the real nether um, loci. And this is, this is what I want to tell you today. So the theme today is describe a moduli space and generic behavior for elements in the moduli space. And then I will look at the complement of the open set that this generic behavior tells me. And that will give me a divisor most of the time. And that divisor will, be, will, be, will tell me something about the moduli space that has something to do with the bidirectional geometry. That's the idea. OK? So, um, so let me get down to the specifics then. Um, OK. So so now, um, 
So theme, theme for today is, um, oops, look at um, the failure. Let me just abbreviate the failure of a generic behavior. Of generic label with G behavior. Behavior. Okay? Of, a, of some moduli space. All right, so let me, let me start um, telling you what moduli space I'm, I'm going to consider. So again, I start with X, say, just start with X and points on the plane, on the projective plane. That's a reasonable algebraic variety. Not so many invariants. I could have started, so this story also, I can tell you the exact same story if you start with, um, with X, um, say, a coherent sheaf of, uh, on P2 of, of higher rank. Um, why am I, am I switching to sheaves here? Is because if you start with N points, I can look at the ideal sheaf that, uh, that those equations define, and that's a sheaf of rank one. Um, I can do the, the exact same story for uh, higher rank sheaves, but I will stick to points because this is, it's easier to uh, rely on, on geometry to tell you the story. So, um, so I start with points. Wait, okay, not, some, not very interesting. But then I turn to a family of points. And this will stand for the Hilbert scheme of endpoints on the plane. And then all of a sudden, this is a very interesting algebraic variety. Um, let me tell you some of its properties. So um, this, the properties I will list here uh, are, you know, theorems. Um, the, the, many of them are not so easy. So first is the, is the accident. This is an accident among Hilbert schemes. This is irreducible. Irreducible, um, smooth, of dimension, of the expected dimension, of dimension 2n. Um, you know, a point on the plane has two degrees of freedom. If I have n points, then I have two n degrees of freedom. That, uh, that's the expected dimension. And then I can now ask about the cohomology and the algebraic classes. And that is being computed as well. So another property of this space is um, the Picard rank. Um, if I tensor it with Q, this coincides with the Neron Severi. Um, this is of rank two. Um, OK, so the divisor theory may not be may not be so difficult to describe. I only have a two-dimensional space to work with, right? And then comes another uh, property that makes this well-behaved. Um, I guess you need to impose the n is bigger than some, right? I'm sorry? You need to impose that n is at least some. Right. Um, right. Um, for one point, this is the plane. That's right. Um, and. Thank you, actually, because these, um, these results, uh, well, they, they do not depend on n, like, strongly. Well, this, of course, depends on n, but I can tell you a regular story for any n. This will change very quickly. Um, so this, this variety is log final that we will learn about in Joaquin's um, mini course. And then one of the consequences of this is that this is, this is a more a dream space. And the, the meaning of this, what I, one of the takes for me of this property is that in, in describing effective classes in the effective cone, I am allowed to expect an, uh, like an honest sub-variety. This is not going to be a pseudo-effective class, which is just the limit of effective ones. And then I have left with nothing but a class. No. If you give me an effective, uh, a class in the effective cone, there is a sub-variety represented in it, okay? 
which is, which is good, because if there is a sub-variety, that means that I can do a little bit of geometry on points and in describing sub-varieties of codimension one. So, um, okay, so let me, so what is the goal? The goal, once I know these properties, so the goal for today um, is to tell you something about the effective cone. The effective cone of this space. And second, um, if I would like to tell you something about the Mori chamber decomposition that I know it has, I know out of this property that has finitely many chambers. So I might be able to, you know, finish the job in telling you what's the Mori chamber decomposition. And if time permits, um, I can tell you something about, well, if time permits, I will just do it. <laughs> but then let me focus on these two, on this, uh, these two properties. So I will make this a bit more precise. Um, so let me write a basis for, uh, for the Picard group. Again, um, this is of rank two, so I need to, t to give you two divisor classes, right? So let me start with um, a line, fix a line. So the first class, will be H defined by points so that they intersect the line. Okay? The line is fixed since the very beginning. So this is a divisorial condition. And the other divisor is these are sub-schemes of the plane. I will look at when at least two points collided, meaning non-reduced sub-schemes, okay? And the, I'm choosing this basis is because this divisor class right here um, is, um, is extremal. Extremal in the effective cone. And that simplifies my job for question number let me number this for my first goal. This simplifies my goal because then I only need to give you one divisor, right? Because I already know. The class, yeah, I'm, I'm just taking the class of this sub-variety. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I always get the same class, yeah. And um, so if I do, if I choose these two classes, then I can write the Picard, I can draw a picture of this type. Oops. Here are the non-reduced, the non-reduced schemes. Say here is, here is H, right? And then I need to tell you what is the other extremal. The other, extremal, um, the other extremal divisor, which I'm calling J, okay? Delta, no. It's, that is right. That is codimension two on cycles, but not on sub-schemes. Sub and actually, if you think of the map, Right, from the Hillary scheme to the Chow variety, this guy gets contracted into a co-dimension two cycle. And um, yeah, so in the Hilbert scheme, it's co-dimension one. Uh, and because of that reason, because it gets contracted, that explains why I'm saying it is extremal. Okay. All right. So um, so for me to finish question number one, I need to give you basically one divisor. Just because the students mentioned this yesterday, the, here is H. If I write this class N minus one, H minus one delta, the ample cone is right here. And 
again, I emphasize that I can tell you the answer for the, for the ample cone in a uniform way, depending on n. So the question number one translates into what is, what's j, right? If I tell you what's j, then I, I am done as far as goal number one goes. Let me simplify question number one just a tiny bit. So um, observe, note that j, whatever it is, will be uh, proportional to some divisor class of this type. To, to H? To this? Yes. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So in the construction of the Hilbert scheme, do you have this, the points, and then you look at all the curves of degree n minus 1 that contains them? And that will give you a map to the Grassmannian. Um, OK. So, um, so I was saying that the divisor class of, of J must be something of this type, right? And then question number one prime, which is slightly easier, um, will be compute, compute that portion. This is the slope, the slope of, what is the slope? Meaning I give you a number, a number of points, say seven, and I'm asking you for another number, which is the slope of this space, okay? And, um, and I'm going to show you in a sec a graph, like a list of those, of those numbers. Um, actually, can we, can we project? Right. Um, for this, for this, for one half, um, well, I, I don't really know. It's a, you, you compute it, yes. Uh, do you get a clue? Because if you apply, for instance, Riemann Hurwitz to compute intersection, intersection numbers with this, that, in, that Riemann Hurwitz always gives you the number multiplied, uh, multiples of two. So that gives a clue that there must be some, some divisor class. If, if these were not, a, anyway. Oh, um, so hopefully you can see, oh gosh, it's a little bit small. Um, but n, n, there are four columns here. Oh, thank you, thank you. And here is n, meaning my number of, the number of points. And, um, and here is the mu, the slope of the effective divisor. And as you can see, it is, it is, it is random. <laughs> it is, and the reason it looks very random is because it is truly random. There is a fractal curve behind this table. Um, and also, I want to make reference to Giancarlo's talk that um, it, is, it is not very clear, but, but then there are Fibonacci numbers here. The number one over there, two, five, and um, there must be 13, and then 29, Well, but anyway, so the Markov numbers are there. And the reason for that is because, um, I don't know if Giancarlo will get to this, but then uh, exceptional bundles on the plane are responsible for this list. And the slope of exceptional bundles um, have some relation with Markov numbers, and Jan probably will tell us something about that. So, Is it increasing in N? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah.
Yeah, it is, it is. I couldn't, I couldn't claim pretty much anything about this list because I know, I know the, where it comes from. And <laughs> um, anyway, so, um, so this is just to emphasize the point. I started with points and I look at their one of their families and, um, and then the problem is, is rather interesting. And you see, whereas this, the ample cone is uniform in N and not so interesting, uh, the effective cone has a very random behavior. And um, so let me tell you some generic, generic behavior where that list is coming from. This is a theorem by Koskun, Wisenga, and Wolf. 2016, and um, I'm, I'm quoting this, this paper because this paper does, um, has this result for sheaves, and uh, for sheaves on the plane, in particular ideal sheaves of points, and that's the, the degree of generality that we can handle to the results uh, I'll tell you later. So, um, but let me state, even though I'm quoting this paper, let me state it for, uh, for the case of the Hilbert scheme. So uh, fix n, right? And then um, the theorem says that there exists a bundle E mu, stable bundle, with a minimal slope such that the cohomology of this tensor product is zero. Meaning, you have a bundle over the plane, and then you can ask, okay, so does that bundle have sections? If the answer is yes, well, what if I want one of those sections to vanish on one point? Well, that imposes the number of conditions of the rank of the bundle. And then you can say, well, if you pick, oh, I'm having, tell you anything about Z. C is where, where C is general. Meaning, if C is general, the, this number of points imposes independent conditions on sections of this bundle. And then, of course, what I'm not telling you is how to find this bundle, right? There is a whole machinery to find this bundle, but I'm telling you a description of it. Is the minimal slope stable bundle with this property? So n is the length of z. N is the length of z, exactly. And, you know, that mu is precisely that mu. Let me write that down. So now I want to, if that holds, now the failure means, this is also part of the theorem, is that uh, then J, which is the points that fail to impose independent conditions on this bundle, is an effective divisor, effective. divisor, and it is extremal. Which is, that is, that is what I wanted to get at. Um, um, the, this? Um, no, because if I, if I change the N, then this bundle changes altogether. And the way it does depends on a fractal curve. Depends on the, the classification of the Dresselle Poitier curve. And, I, and you're asking me how this, is, how this change happens, and I don't, Perhaps it's true, I just couldn't 
claim it myself. Um, okay. Oh, that's right. That may not give you a divisor. No, but what do those conditions propose that they deal with this over zero? And then if, if I restrict it to, uh, to, a to something smaller, may not give you a divisor. It's OK, but maybe this thing here will still be zero. And then this new is not going to be minimal. So. Ah, and, well, you know, um, I'll get to that. But, um, but this, is, this is very tight. So if I restrict it, yeah, this is very tight. So it doesn't, failure of this is not going to keep your divisor. <coughs> so maybe something that you didn't say is that the restructure bundle in new must have like sufficient sections. If the new doesn't have sections, exactly. it doesn't have sections. Again. And I'm not telling you anything about that, but it happens to be like that. I'll give you an example in a sec. Um, actually, let me give the example right now. So, um, so let me focus on six points, right? So for six points, this bundle is nothing but all twisted by two. And the generic behavior you can probably guess. So six general points. When I tensor it, a deal shift with this is zero. That means that six generic points do not lie on a conic. are not on a conic, right? A conic mean a section of this line bundle. And then the failure, you probably can guess what it is. So look at the family of six points so that they lie on a conic. So J is the number of six points so that they are, let me just, <laughs> if there are collinear points, why not? Um, six points that lie on a conic. That will give you, a, it's a divisorial condition on six points. And what I'm saying is that this is, this is the extremal divisor. So I can repeat this, this analysis for this n. As long as the, the d is, the n is a triangular number, I can play this game. 10 points that lie on a cubic will give me a divisor. 15 points that lie on a quartic will give me a divisor, so on, for triangular numbers. The behavior is exactly the same. So E, D will be, here should be plus, right? And bigger than three. And that is pretty much the end when it comes to this, this vector bundle of rank, being of rank one. If you want to analyze another set of numbers, then you need to look at a higher rank bundle. If you see the triangular numbers, say 35, it's an integer. And the reason is because it's, the slope is the slope of a line bundle. Um, I'm getting to that. Thank you, Carolina. Ask me the, the exact same question in 10 minutes. Yes, in 10 minutes. I'm sorry? Oh, um, right. So, um, so far, this, the failure of the generic behavior tells me that there is an effective divisor. And then I need to cook myself up a curve that, um, that, covers, that covers the entire space. And um, that's, that's, how, that's how it goes. Um, so the proof, the proof has two parts. One is describing this, this generic behavior the, well, for vector bundles, which is not trivial. Part of a big chunk of the paper actually, you know, is, is devoted to that computation, that points impose independent conditions. And then the second part is, is producing the curve. Um, okay, so uh, what about other values? And then, let me see if I get to, to emphasize this point. I'm, if I was looking at six points, and the answer is, is, you know, easy enough. Now I want to look at seven points. Should it be that complicated? 
um, once I did <laughs> six points. Um, but if you believe me that this is the end of the road for, uh, for line bundles, I should be expecting a higher rank vector bundle. And that is the case. The theorem says that we need to consider the following bundle. Um, that's three to the eight. Meaning, consider a generic map between these three, three bundles and then take the kernel. This is, uh, this is, it has a name, exceptional bundle of rank five, right? Or a slope 12 over five. If you go and compute the global section of this using this resolution, you will see that it has exact, precisely 35 sections. And, you know, imposing a point requiring that a section vanishes at a given point imposes five conditions because this bundle has rank five. Locally, I need five equations um, to, be, to be satisfied. And then, um, well, you know, it's, it just happens that the numbers are always very tight. Um, so the failure, so J, well, the first computation, which is the generic behavior, is proving that what I said, that generic points imposes independent conditions. And then I will look at F. F will be defined J when the above fails meaning seven points that fail to impose independent conditions. I didn't give this a, nom a name, but it has a name in the literature. This is, this is called the Brill nether divisor. The Brill nether divisor of, of this bundle. Okay. And um, now, um, one last comment about seven points. Um, the tools that I have to analyze the effective cone so have been, so in general, tools that I use to analyze the effective cone um, that have been used to produce this list and, and this bundle um, People have studied this using bridge line stability. So the answer is known. The effective cone and the chambers and the virational models of, this, of the Hilary scheme of points is known for using these techniques, bridge line stability conditions. This, all this description uses, um, let, me, let me call it um, real nether theory that usually tends to go by uh, interpolation. And interpolation comes from these vanishing. And then what I want to tell you today is that I, and which is part of our contribution is to bring in another set of tools, which is um, minimal free resolutions. So these, these two set of tools required quite a heavy, quite a heavy uh, background. Um, and minimal free resolutions are, are quite, are, are, are simple, at least for points on the plane. Um, this goes by the, the name of CCGs. Can I describe this using CCGs? So let me tell you just briefly. So I described you for seven points what's the effective was the effective um, cone. If I were to tell you this bridge line, using bridge line stability, I will tell you that, you know, bridge line stability consists of two things, a subcategory of the drive category of coherent shifts on the plane, and a notion of a slope. And then the extremal, so the extremal wall 
occurs of, of seven points or curves when, when there is a map from the tangent bundle twisted by minus four into the ideal shape of seven generic points. So when is, of course, when this is a destabilizing sequence. Which is rather surprising because for this to be a destabilizing sequence, this needs to be a sub object, but it has rank two. Of course, this is, this is happening in this strange category. So this needs to be a, a sub-object of the ideal shift of the same slope. Of course, I'm not telling you where, where this object is coming from, except that it's come from you know, a subcategory. So the question is, I want to address is um, using this set of tools, right, the personal stability, and this is what we should expect the answer look like. Let me tell you how the answer looks like using CCGs. And then I'm going to state the theorem. Oops. So um, can we can we understand J using CCGs? Well. Um, the answer is yes. And this is joint work with, uh, again, Leal and Tim Ryan. Um, okay. So, um, okay, so let me start with seven points and then seven general points. Seven general points impose independent conditions on cubics, right? Seven general points lie on three cubics, okay? Um, dimension count. That means that the ideal of seven points, let me write these cubics like this, okay? Now, if I want to know whether there are more generators, say generators of degree four, I need to look of the multiplication map. So let me look. If I want to find out whether there are more generators, I need to analyze the multiplication. Oops. If I multiply this cubics by linear forms, I land on quartics that contain the, the seven points, right? But then there is this theorem by Gaeta, by Federico Gaeta, oops, from the 50s, that says that if C is general, general set of points, this multiplication map has maximal rank, then M has maximal rank. And what that means, if you see, is that there is a linear relation between these cubics because there are three linear forms, right, on the plane. There are three cubics. I started with this, with this assumption. And how many quartics are there on seven points? Well, that's 15 minus, se minus seven, that's eight. And if this multiplication map has maximal rank, that means these numbers imply that there exist L1, L2, L3 linear forms such that such that, um, oops, L1, Q1 plus L2, Q2 plus L3, Q3 is equal to zero. That's a CCG of degree four. Degree four. A similar analysis tells us that there is a CCG of degree five, and that's it. Therefore, this implies that I have my three generators Right? I have no more generators, so there is a subjective map to the ideal shift of seven points. And these 
three, three generators have a relation of degree four, which is this relation, and another relation of degree five. And that is the minimal free resolution of the ideal. This map is also written in terms of the CCGs. This matrix is precisely written by the, CC, the linear CCGs and the quadratic ones. It looks like that, okay? It tells you more. It tells you that if you want to recover generators for this, all you have to do is take minors of this matrix. There are three minors of degree three. That's... No, 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 this, these are the relations, exactly. The other CCG, I will have to replace these by quadratic polynomials. Um, okay, so let me tell you that this is continuous data. I can recall the Vetti table, the Gaeta Vetti table, which is when the multiplication map is all, has maximal rank, the, and this is discrete data only recovers that there are three generators of degree three. The degree is by adding these two numbers. And here are generators and here are relations. And there is a relation of degree one, I'm sorry, one relation of degree four and one relation of degree five. So the Gaeta Betty table of seven points, or seven general points looks like this. So now let me tell you how the J divisor looks like in terms of CCGs. So now the proposition, the proposition will be um, that J, right, are points so that they have Gaeta Betty table. That is discrete data. And then the continuous data is that the linear forms are linearly dependent, meaning I can write the CCG matrix like this, 0, L2, L3, R1, up to some change of basis. I can write a 0, and writing a 0 right there is a divisorial condition. And what I'm saying is that that's precisely the divisorial condition I was, um, I wanted to tell you if I want to define the extremal divisor. Um, okay, so, um, but I can tell you a little bit more because this is F, this will be F, right? So you can probably guess what's the generic behavior here, meaning there is an open set in the Hilbert scheme of seven points for which you have Gaeta Betty table and the linear forms are independent. That is the generic behavior, right? So there is an open set, right, when these linear forms are linearly dependent, I'm sorry, independent, I have them here. And look at this subcomplex of the minimal free. I know it has maximal rank, therefore I will replace it by its co-kernel. And the co-kernel of this subcomplex is nothing but the tangent bundle twisted by minus four. So the generic behavior is that the minimal free resolution, right, transforms into this sequence. And do you know why I wanted to get here? So I want to claim that this is precisely the destabilizing object that is responsible for the extremal world. Well. well, the theorem I'm going to state and, um, is that we can do this in full generality, not just for points, but for vector bundles on the plane. Let me grade it. Let me grade the statement. So the theorem. Oh, I'm sorry, Leia. I should have come first. Sorry. Um, so the theorem is that there is an open set. As I said, here I can replace here I can replace this Hilbert scheme by a moduli space of stable vector bundles on the plane, and um, whose elements uh, 
um, satisfy satisfy um, that they have um, that they have a Gaeta very table. This is discrete data, right? And it's their minimal free resolution. Minimal free resolution has a subcomplex similar to the subcomplex of the minimal free resolution of generic seven points that, um, that is the, the minimal free resolution of, uh, of the Bridgeland destabilizing object. responsible that induces the, the extremal well. The extremal. Meaning, do you have a bundle over P2 or N points, and you compute the most generic um, Gaeta minimal free resolution? That will give you a free resolution, like the one it was written here. This is, this is no longer free but the one that was written before, in terms of free objects. And I have some way of, um, of singling out a subcomplex of that minimal free resolution that gives you the minimal free resolution of the Bridgeland destabilizing object. Meaning, it is the Bridgeland destabilizing objects now arise naturally from the minimal free resolution. And this is, the, computing the minimal free resolution is, um, as, I did, as I did here, is, is quite a straightforward. A computer can do it. Um, and this is the generic behavior. And now the second part of the theorem says that J is, is precisely when that generic behavior fails, meaning similar to this, that the complex fails to have maximal rank. So, um, so now, this will be generic behavior, and then J is defined or described, is determined by, by the failure of the WAP. Meaning the subcomplex fails to have maximal rank. Now, that's, that's, Yes, it's right. So what I'm saying is that the complement of, of U0 most of the time will give you a divisor. And the divisor that you're looking for is, I'm sorry, and that divisor is the extremal divisor of the effective cone. Because like in the Brill nether uh, case for curves, the complement may not be a divisor. So I need to, you know, put myself in the case when it is a divisor. And there are many cases there are many cases where um, it is a divisor. For instance, it will be a divisor. It will be a divisor when these two numbers are the same. That is the actual description of J. But we can compute the class in general. But now to get to the this works for any n exactly, and for and not just for points, in, but for vector bundles. Yes, and. Um, and to get, I have, oh, I have one minute. And to get I, get, I get something interesting out of this theorem. And I know, now I know the generic element in the divisor, which is precisely, precisely when, when the subcomplex fails to have maximal rank. And I can iterate the process. So that's me. I can iterate the process. And um, if you do that, you start getting all the walls. So what I'm claiming is that I can repeat what I said here for all the walls using minimal free resolutions. That's something that we didn't know how to do with interpolation. And the next slide gives you an idea of here are the minimal free resolutions 
and how they behave, because I have many Betty tables, and I only showed you what happens for the Gaeta Betty table. So here I have other Betty tables, and here I have the Bridgeland destabilizing objects showing up in the minimal free resolution. Up there is the Bridgeland, the Bridgeland wall structure with their respective destabilizing objects, and then if you see, they are popping up here. And that is the, um, the stable base locus decomposition that we can also compute out of this process, just for seven points. Um, that, yeah, that's, that's what I have. Well, thank you very much. And before we get to questions, just one second, because I'm kind of was trying to recap. I was seven years ago here, and then, you know, I can recognize myself right there. And, <laughs> and many of you, too. Anyway. Well, yeah, <laughs> the one that says Canada, huh? <laughs> well, anyway, this is for me to say thank you again. Thank you for the invitation. It's been a great pleasure.